Hallelujah. You may be seated. Praise God. doing. I just put on the prayer line yesterday or the day before that my sister, my eldest sister had a, a stroke. She was unable to talk and, um, and walk and all of that. So please pray. Well, I just got a call about three o'clock this afternoon saying she's talking and she's walking. Not <laughs> Her, her voice her voice is very so soft and raspy and she can only walk a few steps with assistance but our God is able and the reason I'm really impressed is she had her heart attack on Sunday and they have that six they call that six hour window when they can help you through the stroke she didn't go to the doctor until Monday afternoon so it was God <laughs> amen they can't deny it it was God Amen. God said, I ain't done with her. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Praise God, everybody. <laughs> Hallelujah. <clears throat> well, we want to welcome you to uh, our Bible study tonight. And we'll start out, as always, with a word of prayer. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Lord, we come before you tonight, God, and we ask you to open our eyes so that we might be able to see, God, and open our ears so that we might be able to hear. We ask you tonight, Lord, to do whatever it takes to draw us closer to you. We reject any unbelief that may come into this place right now, and we welcome the spirit of faith, O oh God, this faith that only comes from you tonight, Jesus. Hallelujah. We ask that you would bless this Bible study tonight, and we ask that you would bless each and every person here in a special way. And God, our pastor is at home sick right now. We pray that your healing virtue, God, would come upon him right now. We speak faith, O oh God. We speak healing into his body right now. Let him receive it, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Let there be a mighty outpouring of the Spirit of God in that apartment right now. Praise God. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Um, could you put up that title, Reggie? Now, several years ago, I taught a Bible study on the Feast of the Lord. And when I began to pray as to what direction I should go in for this Bible study tonight, I felt that the coming of the Lord was so near that I felt I needed to revisit that subject tonight. And for those of you that are not aware, the Feast of Passover is coming up in 12 days, which makes this Bible study all the more relevant. So let's go to the 23rd chapter of Leviticus, verses 1 and 2. It says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, The feast of the Lord which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, they are, these are my feasts. Notice that God says right there, These are my feasts. So there's a few things we need to mention. This is something that's very close to God's heart. Praise God. And these feasts were instituted by Jehovah himself. The people had no part in choosing when the feasts were or what, what season that they would be in. Praise God. So and what exactly is a holy convocation? It's the assembly or coming together for a specific purpose, in this case, to worship God. And that pretty much sounds like why we came together tonight, amen? Yeah. Yeah. 
So we're having a holy convocation ourselves here tonight. Now the feasts of the Lord are seven in number, starting with Passover. Then comes unle unleavened bread, followed by first fruits, then Pentecost, followed by trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and lastly, the Feast of Tabernacles. So there's a few things that I hope to bring out in this Bible study tonight, and that is to show that God is in control of all things, all right. All right. All right. to show that his word is perfect, is. and to reveal God's prophetic timetable. Yes. Praise God. These seven feasts are described in Leviticus. They were appointed, uh, appointed seasons by God, set apart by him, a time for his people to gather together to worship their Lord. These appointed seasons are for planting, growing, and harvest. Now the Bible says to everything there is a season, amen? amen. And we will see tonight how these feasts represent those appointed seasons. Praise God. And there's more to these feasts than merely a time of worship. The feasts of the Lord were but types and shadows of things yet to come. They revealed God's plan for this world even to the end of the age. And they bring to us the unfolding plan of redemption ordained by God himself. Therefore, an Old Testament type is literally a word picture or a living example of that which is to come. It is an exact shadow of that which does not yet exist, if we can try to understand that tonight. The book of Leviticus is a book about worship. I don't know if you read that book, but it's a tough book to get through. But it is a book about worship, for it teaches us how to conduct ourselves properly in the presence of God. And it also is a book about holiness, for the message of holiness is mentioned 87 times throughout the book. And we can see in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 2, what it says. It says, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Praise God. So the one thing that God wanted was that his people would remember these feast days precisely. For an error in the celebration of the Day of Atonement, for example, would result in banishment from the camp. And we, <clears throat> and we need to remember, this book was written 3,500 years ago. That's 1,500 years before Jesus Christ, which we'll see tonight makes it all the more remarkable. So let me begin with the festival of Passover. It speaks about that in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 5. It says, On the fourteenth day of the first month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. So the Lord only gives a single verse of instruction here for the Passover was uh, recently experienced by God's people when they were brought out of Egypt. Praise God. So Passover was extremely important to God's people. For all the other feasts would be celebrated with Passover as the starting point. So the people had to get it right, and this is how God helped them to do that. He developed a calendar based on the phases of the moon. Each month started with a new moon, reaching a full moon in the midst of the 28-day cycle, so Passover always falls on a full moon, the first full moon of spring. Now the meaning of Passover is surely a feast of redemption. Yes. For the blood of the Lamb delivered the nation of Israel from the slavery of sin. Yes. Praise God. I'd like to read Exodus chapter 12, verse 13. It says, Now the blood of the Lamb shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when, you, when I see the blood, 
I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you while I strike the land of Egypt. Praise God. Now also the lamb they sacrificed had to be without blemish because it was pointing to another lamb that would come 1,500 years in the future. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 speaks about this. It says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Praise God. So today the blood of Jesus Christ continues to deliver us from the slavery of sin. Praise God. As you can see, it's no coincidence that the Lord himself was sacrificed on Passover. For God had planned this from the very beginning. Praise God. The Apostle Paul confirms this in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. It says, Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Praise God. So the prophetic fulfillment of the Passover feast was completely and minutely fulfilled in the death of Jesus Christ. The exact fulfillment of Passover on the exact day illustrates a principle which you'll see for each of the feasts. The Lord fulfilled each feast on the exact day according to his prophetic plan. We'll see that all seven feasts were either fulfilled or were prophesied to be fulfilled and it was recorded in Leviticus 3,500 years ago. Praise God. The next feast begins on the very next day in Leviticus 23, verse 6. Praise God. Leviticus 23, verse 6. I'll just read it. And on the 15th day of the same month is the feast, feast of unleavened bread to the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. So God told his people to eat only unleavened bread during the week following Passover. And leaven in the Bible we know symbolizes sin. So unleavened bread eaten over a period of seven days symbolizes a holy walk with the Lord. And it's mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. Praise God. It says, Therefore let us keep the feast not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Praise God. Now, the way the unleavened bread was made was a perfect picture of our Lord. The bread, it says that the bread was striped. Isaiah 53, 5 says, by his stripes we are healed. It says that the bread was pierced. John 19, 37 says they shall look on him whom they pierced. So the bread was without leaven as his body was without sin. So this feast was fulfilled in a remarkable way for Jesus was buried at the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Jesus was buried at the exact time and he would rise again according to the schedule of the Feast of the Lord. The third feast is the Feast of First Fruits and it was held on the Sunday following Unleavened Bread talks about that in Leviticus 23 verse 10 it says speak to the children of Israel and say to them when you come into the land which I give to you and reap its harvest 
Then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. So God wanted a special feast that would celebrate the fertility of the land that he gave them. They were to bring the early crops of their spring planting or the first fruits to the priest to be waved before the Lord on their behalf. Praise God. This was to be done on the day after the Sabbath, on a Sunday. That Sunday would be the feast of first fruits. But God didn't pick some arbitrary day to be raised from the dead. Praise God. But he was resurrected on the day of first fruits, the day that we call Easter. And since Jesus was the first fruits, every born again believer will be resurrected and follow the same path that our Lord went. That same path to heaven, praise God. The Apostle Paul tells us that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 23. It said, but each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. That's us, church. Praise God. Hallelujah. Now this is truly a time to celebrate and thank God. For we too will be resurrected one day, just as our Lord was. Why don't we thank him right now? Praise God. Lord, we praise you. We worship you. We glorify you. We give thanks to you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your direction tonight, oh God. Oh, hallelujah. Now, the next feast is spoken of in Leviticus 23, 15. It says, And you shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be completed. They were to count 50 days after the seventh Sabbath. Seven Sabbaths were known as the Feast of Weeks, and we know this today as Pentecost. Now, if we look at the book of Acts, we read in chapter 1, verse 3, it says, To whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So Jesus spent 40 days with his disciples after his resurrection. He then told them to wait for the promise of the Father. Amen? So when the Holy Ghost was poured out, it came exactly on the day of Pentecost. It, it came according to God's prophetic plan. And the fulfillment was in keeping with the purpose of the feast. A harvest of 3,000 souls were gathered that day. Now it says in the 32nd chapter of Exodus that 3,000 men were killed for worshiping a golden calf. Now on the day of Pentecost, the Bible tells us that 3,000 were saved. So 3,000 died because they chose not to believe, and 3,000 were saved because they chose to believe. So what we believe is crucial. Praise God. So the first three feasts that I've spoken about tonight have already been fulfilled in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The fourth feast, or Pentecost, is still in the process of being fulfilled today since the church is still being added to. Amen? So the remaining three feasts will be fulfilled at some time in the future. And this next feast is, this is incredible to me. The next feast is the Feast of Trumpets. And we read about that in Leviticus 23, verse 24. Praise God. It says, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest 
a memorial of blowing the trumpets, a holy convocation. So to help us understand the time frame that it's talking about here, the first three feasts that I talked about tonight occurred in the first month of the Jewish calendar, which normally is in April. Pentecost occurred in the, occurred in the early part of summer. Now this first, this feast that we're talking about occurs in the seventh month or sometime in sub September. So there's one thing we need to understand as the feasts move ahead on the calendar, they are also moving ahead on God's prophetic timetable. So we can see that the trumpet is very important to God, amen? For it's mentioned throughout the Bible. To Israel, the trumpet was a signal for the field workers to come to the temple. The high priest actually stood on the wall of the temple and blew the trumpet for all to hear. And at that moment, the faithful would stop harvesting, even if there were more co crops to bring in, and they would leave immediately for worship service in the temple. They were responding to the blowing of the trumpet. But what an incredible symbolism is used here, for we can see how perfectly the Lord planned all this when we read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. It says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Praise God. So the Feast of Trumpets will be prophetically fulfilled when the rapture of the church takes place. And we're very close to that time tonight. Amen? Praise God. Praise God. Oh, hallelujah. Help us to understand where we're at in God's timetable. Hallelujah. Let's ask God to touch our minds right now. Hallelujah. God, there's an urgency in the atmosphere that we can feel. It's so thick sometimes, God. It's, we know something is happening that is beyond what we can control, Lord. God, this feast that we just talked about, the Feast of Trumpets, God, it can happen at any moment. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to understand what's happening in the spirit realm so that we don't come become lackadaisical, God, in our walk with you. Oh, hallelujah. We thank you, God, for what you're doing tonight. Praise God. Now we move to the most sacred of Jewish feasts, the Day of Atonement. Let me read Leviticus 23, verse 27. It says also the tenth day of this seventh month shall be the Day of Atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. So this was a time of confession. Israel was to afflict their souls and become conscious of their sin. It was a time of fasting. So it wasn't a feast in the traditional sense, praise God, but it was called the Feast of Reconciliation or a time to be reunited with their Lord. So the high priest would enter into the most holy place on that day. He would make a sacrifice for his own self on his own behalf, and then he would make a sacrifice on behalf of the people. It was the highest of the holy days. We read about it in Leviticus 23, verses 28 and 29. It says, And you shall do no work on that same day, for it is the day of atonement, to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For any person who is not afflicted in soul on that same day shall be cut off from his people. 
As you can see, God took this very seriously. Praise God. Now, the New Testament church has already been atoned for when Jesus shed his blood on the cross. Amen? But the day of atonement will one day be fulfilled for the Jewish believer. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10 speaks about this. Praise God. It says, And I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on them, on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. Praise God. The sorrow felt by Israel on that day will be hard to imagine, but they will at last be in the presence of their Messiah. Amen? Their atonement will be accepted. Romans chapter 11 verse 26 tells us that. Praise God. It says, and so all Israel will be saved. Praise the Lord. So this feast will be prophetically fulfilled when the Lord returns to the earth in his glory as Israel's Messiah. Praise God. Now the last feast is spoken of in, in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 34. It says, Speak to the children of Israel, saying the 15th day of the seventh month, shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days to the Lord. God goes on to say in verses 42 and 44, through 44, And you shall dwell in booths for seven days. All who are native Israelites shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt, I am the Lord, your God. So Moses declared to the children of Israel the feast of the Lord. Praise God. So God wanted to celebrate the fact that he provided shelter for his people in the wilderness. Symbolically, tabernacles represents the Lord's shelter in the world to come. I believe that the Feast of Tabernacles will be prophetically fulfilled when God himself rules the new heaven and the new earth as seen in the book of Revelation. Zechariah 14, 16 speaks about this. And it says, And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Praise God. So from examining the Feast of the Lord here tonight, I think we can conclude that God is in control. Amen? Amen. He is the creator of all things. He is the master planner. Nothing escapes his attention. And these feasts are close to God's heart. And whenever something is close to God's heart, we need to pay attention to what that is. Amen? So let me close with this tonight. I would like to mention something that the Lord shared with me, something that is also close to the Lord's heart. Let me go to Psalm 19, verses 12 through 14. It says, this is a psalm of David. And the Lord wanted me to speak this tonight for some reason. I'm not sure why, but I'm just being obedient. David said, who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. So what exactly is a presumptuous sin? That's when you know something is, is a sin and you go ahead and do it anyway. 
Now, when someone commits such a sin, and I'm including myself in that, it breaks God's heart. And I think the last thing we all want to do tonight is to break God's heart. Amen? But it doesn't end there. David goes on to say, let them, he's talking about presumptuous sins, not have dominion over me, then I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Then David ends with this prayer. He said, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Praise God. So you'll notice here David went from repentance to praise. Amen? Yeah. Praise God. And I don't know about you, but I can feel God's mercy in this house tonight. Praise God. So if we could all stand... Now, if you know of someone who needs God, would you come forward to pray for them tonight? And if God directs you to go and pray for somebody here in this sanctuary tonight, if the Lord speaks to you and asks you to go and pray for somebody, would you go and pray for them tonight? Praise God. Oh, hallelujah. I can feel God's mercy in this house, church. God's heart is open.